Miracy. Anyone can lead from any seat, right? It's just being human gives us the ability to develop leadership qualities, and we might develop them in different ways based on our own life experiences. But ultimately, any one of us can be visionary. Any one of us can make good decisions or collaborate effectively or be in a process of continuous learning. I'm Sharon Richmond, and this is To Lead as Human. For more than 30 years, I run a business called Leading Large. I help C-level executives expand their impact, clarifying their priorities, energizing their organizations, and building cultures of accountability and respect. In this podcast, we help you envision how to supercharge your leadership by introducing you to executives who lead with intention. These top organizational leaders exemplify the principles of leading large. They know that as leaders, the power of their position comes with an equal measure of responsibility. These leaders run successful organizations, delivering stellar value to their customers, clients, and stakeholders, while also prioritizing building organizations that provide purpose, meaning, and a healthy working environment for employees. We learn from the challenges and successes they've experienced on their human journey. My guest on the show today is Dr. Geeta Murali. As we talk, you may want to pay special attention to the similarities and differences we discuss between being CEO of a global not-for-profit versus CEO of a for-profit company. Geetha is the CEO of Room to Read, a leading international organization dedicated to creating a world free from illiteracy and gender inequality. As CEO, Geetha has led the exponential scaling of Room to Read's quality programs, benefiting more than 32 million children to date in 21 plus countries. Geetha joined Room to Read in 2009 after more than a decade of diverse experiences across the corporate, academic, and nonprofit sectors. She received her master's in biostatistics from UNC Chapel Hill and both master's and doctorate degrees in South Asian politics from UC Berkeley. Geetha's work has been recognized by former US First Lady Michelle Obama as well as by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And Geetha's also been featured in international media outlets from the BBC and Bloomberg to ABC, CNBC, The Times of India, and Wired Magazine. We are super, super lucky to have you here today, Geetha. Welcome to the show, and we are really looking forward to hearing what you've learned along your own leadership journey. Thanks, Sharon, so much for having me. Excited for our conversation. Likewise. So let's just start with a brief overview of the leadership progression before becoming CEO, what kind of roles you had, and what maybe what you learned for each of them, if you can think of a takeaway. Sure. I started my career in the quantitative sciences, actually thinking that my future was going to be in biostatistics. My mom was a biostatistician, and I sort of followed in her footsteps because she believed that at that time, just being an immigrant in the United States and making her career the quantitative sciences, that my future would be set and that something like statistics would ensure that I always had a job. And if you sort of think of the mindset that she was coming from at that time in the 70s, she had run away from home when they wanted her to get married. And she had lived a life of survival, you know, trying to get herself educated and support her family. So she really raised me with that love of math and learning my times tables really early and all of that. So I ended up in my early 20s with master's in biostats and working in the pharmaceutical industry and thinking, you know, this is going to be the next 45 years of my life. And I figured out pretty quickly that it wasn't going to keep me fulfilled. And so I began the journey of first taking some classes at Berkeley to expose myself to topics and conversations that I had never been a part of before and ultimately found myself in incredible course on politics where the professor was using the statistics that were most applicable in the social sciences to think about the role of elections and election surveys and voter expectations and how communities are shaped and different things like that. And so I said, why not explore this further and uh, ended up pursuing my sort of second graduate career 
in South Asian politics, spending time in Asia, conducting surveys, talking to a lot of communities. And I found during that period that there were so many communities around the world that were working actively to change their reality. And what I was doing while powerful in its own right and using statistics in a different way was not necessarily helping them solve their problems. And so that began my exploration into the nonprofit world and social sector organizations. And interestingly, in terms of lessons, which was your question originally, is that as I became more confident in my skills and my ability to apply statistics in a lot of different settings, my aptitude, I think, for risk tolerance and flexibility went up. And I think one of the big lessons of my career was that as my confidence increased, I was able to take more risks. I was able to be more flexible. I was able to pursue the types of opportunities and make the types of decisions that perhaps I might not have made early in my career. The second big lesson was really that people matter, right? You can have functional skills in areas that are valuable to markets and to organizations, but learning from the perspectives and experiences of others, I think, is invaluable. So probably my next big moment of change was joining Room to Read 14 years ago and developing my career path here. And if I think about it, I've had six supervisors over that 14-year period and four board chairs because our board chairs serve two-year terms. And so those four board chairs, they were, in fact, a part of the CEO selection process for me. And I've learned so much from each of them because they each have different leadership styles. And they committed to serving as board chairs as I came on as CEO to stabilize the organization and do the founder transitions. And, you know, if I add to that, I work with boards all over the world, statutory boards. I'm a part of professional organizations like YPO. And what I've learned through all of that is really valuing and nurturing relationships add to whatever functional skill sets you might have, because ultimately having talent on the right timeline, a specific location or getting stuck with a legal challenge and having that person you can pick up the phone to a friend, an advocate, a mentor that takes my call. I think that's really shaped my journey as well. So in addition to the skills, you know, people matter. Definitely people matter. So what do you think maybe some of the lessons from some of your board chairs that maybe help you become more of an inspirational leader? You know, each of them has had their own style. And I learned that in any relationship, you can get from it what you put into it, right? And leadership looks different in different people. And I think sometimes, you know, when we're younger in our careers, we have this vision of what leadership is. And as I've grown through my career, I've really recognized that you can see those leadership qualities, right? Be it vision and, and strategic thinking or resilience or conflict resolution, you can see those skills manifest differently in different people based on the experiences that they've had. And I think if you're too busy trying to compare every supervisor, or every leader to some vision of what you think leadership is, and sometimes I think, you know, early in our careers, we think money, power, influence is really those leadership qualities or indicators of success. And as you get through your career, you realize that you can have all of those things, but still not feel successful or still not really feel like a leader in your own skin. And I think what I've learned from all of my board chairs is that each of them in their own right had leadership qualities that they were able to bring to my journey, be that how to think about staff members and their needs differently based on where they perhaps may be in life and in their careers, be it thinking about how to prepare for big meetings and how to show up and own your position and be it thinking about how to conduct yourself externally with new people and to feel like you can be your real authentic self and not have to sort of follow a role model that you think might have dictated what a leader could be in the generation before. I think we've come so far and these rooms are changing and the conversations are changing around leadership all for the better. That's great. So it sounds like you've put together a picture for yourself of what you think is important in leadership. Maybe could you describe your leadership principles or some tenets that you value and work to follow? Sure. When I think about what it means to lead, for me, it's largely been, you know, being a good example of the qualities and the behaviors I want to see in my organization. To be humble, but at the same time bold, right? To be kind, but also clear. And just recognizing that, especially in a business like ours, where we're working all over the world, we have to recognize and value diversity in background, in motivations, 
in our thought, in our actions, if we're going to bring really the best solutions to the table for some of the biggest global challenges that we're trying to take on. When I've got 1,600 staff all over the world, I have to live the values that I espouse to my staff and to the world externally. I think the other part of leadership I take very seriously is just supporting the individual and helping each person bring their best to room to read. So for example, we've got staff members who are at different points in their careers. Some may live a life where their career is front and center, and that's what motivates them. Some may need to dial down at certain points due to family commitments or life ambitions. And as we grow globally and in our own operational experience, we want to keep our core sort of non-negotiables in mind, things like being passionate about education, being action-oriented, the importance of partnering internally, externally, because the challenge we're working on is just too large to think of it any other way, operating with respect and accountability to each other and the communities we serve, because honestly, the work is just hard enough without adding bad attitudes to the mix, right? Thinking about scale, right? We want solutions that are going to solve these problems in our lifetime. So we have our non-negotiables. And as long as you are on board with those key fundamental parts of who Room to Read is, then we want you involved as a staff member, a board member, a volunteer, a partner, an advocate. And we invite people to sort of choose their journey and the mission finds space for you. So that piece of the individual and how they interact with our organization and our mission is also front and center for me as a leader. And 1,600 employees, where in the world are they located and what kinds of work are they doing? The majority of our staff are community-based. They are either what we call literacy facilitators or coaches working directly in schools, helping to implement reading programs all over the world in partnership with governments as they sort of transform their systems. Or they're what we call social mobilizers, who are mentors for young women who are navigating a range of different challenges in their everyday lives to stay in school and to complete school with the skills they need to make good decisions. And sounds like maybe mostly virtual or hybrid? In terms of our senior leadership team, we definitely have to be virtual for the most part. And we're always operating across time zones, as you know, the puzzle pieces to get everyone together. But I know you've talked a lot about asynchronous and synchronous working, and we're very conscious of what needs to be done together as a leadership team and where we need to grow together and respond to issues together versus where perhaps individual contribution and other ways of working might support our efforts better. So when you started working at Room to Read, did you imagine that you would become the CEO? I definitely didn't imagine becoming the CEO. And I tell folks this all the time that when I started in my career, I didn't even realize being the CEO of a nonprofit was a role that someone could aspire to. And I think the world just changes so much. And we have to be ready to learn about our skills, learn about ourselves, and take advantage of different opportunities. When I came into Room to Read, my goal was really to just be somewhere where I felt every day I was contributing to something that was addressing challenges that I knew with my own eyes and my own experience existed, right? Because I came from a family where I could have very easily been a child bride, and I wanted to do something that made that not even a possibility, right, for the next generation. So that's sort of what my initial impetus was for coming into the organization. But then I recognized that I was a part of creating its culture. I was a part of creating something new and different for the world in terms of how we operated. And that was very special to me. And it's probably what's kept me here. So how could you describe or how might some of your team members describe that special way that you're building the culture? So Room to Read is very clear, as I was mentioning earlier about our non-negotiables, our kind of core values of what makes us who we are. And everything from the ways and forums that we bring staff members together, we sort of grounded that in what we call the respect model that comes out of uh, Paul Marciano's work on respect, the notion that staff members need recognition and empowerment, feedback, the ability to partner, to have clear expectations and consideration, as well as just an underlying sense of trust between leaders and staff members. And also the notion that a staff member can lead from any seat. And that is something that has been very critical to the way we think about leadership, right? Because if you really think about what is a leader, I mean, to lead by example, to light a path for others, right? To see perhaps opportunities and direction that you may not have considered before. And that to me is very critical to how we operate because as a nonprofit, we're not resource 
heavy. We don't have abundant resources to work with. And so every individual has to be able to contribute at their best and we have to support them in doing so. So in that kind of a culture, what's the approach that you all take when somebody is underperforming? Well, we have to be honest. We have to be accountable, right? And I think with a nonprofit, sometimes there is this tendency to think of our sector as you know, relaxed, maybe easygoing, not goal oriented, or maybe somewhere where people go after a really hard career to, you know, work less hours or contribute their skills at their will. And that's not how we run this organization. It's very goal oriented, very performance driven. We have people who could be in many, many other types of positions and sectors who've chosen to come and contribute their skills to this organization. And so because we are so focused on our mission, which is, you know, how many more children can we benefit every year and how do we get to more children more quickly? It is very easy to identify when someone is not performing per the goals and expectations that have been set. So we're pretty honest about that. We talk through it pretty openly. And, you know, like most other organizations, you know, the fit is quite clear pretty soon. And if you're not wanting to sort of give your time, talent to this mission, and that's going to show. So one thing I appreciate about what you just said is the image that people have in their minds about how nonprofits are run. And it isn't really always true at all. I think a lot of not-for-profit organizations are just as results-driven and results-oriented as for-profit. I'm wondering if you see any differences in leadership being in a not-for-profit organization, building and growing and scaling it, than maybe what would be needed in a for-profit? Or maybe you see more similarities. I'm not sure which, but I'd love to hear what you think. There's a lot of similarities, I think, if you're a results-oriented organization in terms of, you know, setting goals, having reviews, and looking at performance and all of these pieces, right? What I think can sometimes be different as a nonprofit leader and how we work is that ultimately profit is not really what drives our final decision, right? We are looking at impact. In our case, we're looking at the number of children we're able to benefit and how quickly we're able to benefit them. We are looking to mirror almost exactly our practice with our purpose. And I think sometimes in for-profit, purpose is, of course, important. But when it comes down to it and you're really looking at that tension, profit may win out. Whereas for us, you know, we're working on a lot of things that no one would ever think are profitable. And we're just doing them because it's the right thing to do. And that's what drives us. Mm, That's great. So let's see. There was a Forbes article that you wrote and you mentioned that nonprofits should be seen more often as more than just social engines, also as economic engines. I'm wondering if you could just expound on that a little bit for our listeners and share how you think other nonprofit leaders could better embrace that perspective. Yeah, so over the last, I'd say, decade of my career in this space, there's been a major shift away from the binary of for-profit and nonprofit, right? You see things like ESG-related guidance for companies. You see the idea of having B Corps, or you think about how purpose is really becoming a part of marketing and corporate affairs and different things like that. So the binary has moved away, and I think the nice part of that is that you start seeing the direct linkages between doing good and making money, right? And those things are not completely independent of each other. Secondly, the nonprofit sector or social impact sector more broadly is one of the largest employers globally as well. So you have to keep in mind that it is a key part of the economics of every country, But add to that that much of the work, the services being provided, the programs being delivered are in the interest of social and economic development. So if I take, for example, what Room to Read does, we're one of the largest children's book publishers in languages that are not profitable to publish in. And what we've done is really look at how publishers, small publishers all over the world can make producing high quality children's books profitable. Because ultimately, if publishers aren't publishing good quality books, children aren't reading them. And so it's important to look at those linkages because the nonprofit world is really looking at creating better economies, healthier livelihoods, et cetera, for the next generation. And so we are one of the largest economic drivers in that regard. And I suppose the people that you're serving, they're children today, but they grow up just like we all do, hopefully. So then do you see that they also become drivers of economic 
growth and opportunity in their communities? Most definitely. We have so many stories of young people who've made it through our programs and have gone on to become doctors, for example. And interestingly, we're about to release a film showcasing some of the young women who've come through our programs in that everything from a young woman who becomes a YouTube star and has gone viral in Vietnam and is supporting her family that way to a young woman who was facing food scarcity with her family and her family wanted her to drop out of school and become a maid in another home and instead using the skills that she had learned around the environment and climate related issues. She now wants to be an agricultural officer, is advocating for wells. So this is sort of commonplace for us and you see it within a single generation. And I say that all the time about myself, it was a single generation that child marriage was erased from my family. And, you know, we went from child bride to CEO. So education is quite powerful and it's a huge economic driver and we can't underestimate it. And so for leaders of other nonprofits, What thoughts do you have for how to help them see beyond just the service level to the economic driving forces? I think the biggest thing you can do, and this is actually, I would say, is not just a lesson for nonprofit leaders, but leaders in general, is to really listen with the intent to learn. Because if you do that, you start understanding the things that drive other organizations. You know, we Room to Read is privately funded, so a lot of my time is spent with very influential leaders of for-profit industries. And we learn a lot from each other, right? This idea of what it takes to be a leader and how do you blend the functional skill sets that you have and the management leadership skills that you have with those skills that are necessary to motivate and to inspire and to really engage your customers, your beneficiaries, in the case of perhaps nonprofits or your staff, right? This all comes down to our ability to look beyond these binaries and think about how do we collectively make our society better and stronger and more resilient. So you said that you've been a member of YPO for a while. That's the Young Presidents Organization for folks that don't know. And I know that a lot of the members are members of for-profit organizations. So I'm curious, what kinds of insights have you been able to share with those folks that maybe they wouldn't have picked up on? Yeah, I think the primary conversations that perhaps I've led on that have been different have been in terms of thinking about how practice and purpose blend and what that looks like in a for-profit setting, what that can look like in a social impact organization, and perhaps how those things are a lot more similar than we might think. So looking at kind of values-based leadership, and how you show up as an executive. I think that those lessons are similar no matter what kind of organization you lead. And for me personally, you know, I went through in 2020 around the pandemic a pretty big kind of medical issue in terms of I had a a spinal tumor that was discovered. We were right in the middle of the pandemic. Everything was sort of shut down. I went through a pretty extensive surgery and had to sort of learn to walk again, you know, rehab and all of these different things. And, you know, you go through moments like that and you really reflect on, well, what do I want to be as a leader? Why am I here? Right? What's my purpose going forward? And if, in fact, I only have 4,000 weeks, right, as they say, how do I really prioritize my time and my energy and do the best that I can? What is my legacy as I move ahead? And in YPO, we've talked a lot about, right, what it means to leave legacy, not just financial wills, but ethical wills. And what kinds of people do we want to be? And what do we want to leave for the next generation of leaders within our own companies, let alone the next generation of children on this planet? So there's a lot to explore. And rather than kind of thinking about some sort of sense of what the perfect leader is, really striving to be the best leader that I can be and showing up when I meet other leaders and sharing my experiences is hopefully going to make us all collectively better, where people really trust us and expect us to lead by example. Yeah, I think that that's a great segue to the question I wanted to ask you next. So I like on this show to invite guests to share some of the kind of more personal, maybe open the kimono moments, if you're willing, and talk about one or two of the big challenges that you personally faced as a leader and what you had to learn about yourself in order to be that best leader that you can be. So I'll invite you to share. I think maybe the two that I'll share, one is when I first became CEO. You know, Rintreed had a very established 
way of working. The brand was very strong. The founders were well known. And I was the first non-founder CEO. And so I was working through the transitions of the founders, looking at building a newly constituted leadership team, thinking about the future, right, all at the same time. It really was a balance of taking the best of who we were and pushing our thinking and our skills and our plans further, right? And there were many moments that now as I reflect back, not just at that particular transition, but over my career that I do believe my potential was underestimated, right? Did I look like the leader people were used to, right? Is she too young? Does she have the experience, the style, the strength of commitment? People didn't always see me the way I saw myself. And so I needed to speak up and articulate my point of view. And it was important to do that because my point of view was not always the same. In many cases, was very, very different from the other people at the table. So I, that was a huge learning. It was a learning that I was hit in the face with a couple of times because if I didn't articulate my point of view, things would go a completely different direction, right? And then I was stuck with the decision. And so once I got comfortable with that, and that wasn't as CEO, but much earlier in my career, recognizing that about myself, you know, becoming CEO and finding my own leadership style and sharing that leadership style was a lot easier because at that point I knew, look, if I don't do it, no one else will. Yeah. And you said there was a second example. The other was having my surgery. And it was a moment in Room to Read's history that was challenged by a lot of different things. We had the pandemic ongoing. We were kind of reorganizing the organizations. We slashed our budgets right up front by about 20% because we knew we weren't having events. So we weren't sure if we'd be able to achieve our resource goals for the year. In addition, the United States was dealing with a lot of reflection over systemic racism and the role of diversity in organizations. And personally, I was going through this sort of, you know, life altering moment and recognizing models for other potential leaders. And I sort of harp on this again and again, is that you can be a leader from every seat, right? And it's a really important that people recognize that in ourselves. I mean, we're all born the same way biologically, but we develop leadership skills and address them or identify them differently, right? Based on our own experiences. So recognizing that your journey can make you a leader. You can be resourced when you're young or not. You can be male or you can be female. You can be all kinds of different things and still be a leader. And recognizing that, I think, is so important, especially when you're early in your career, because otherwise you may be working towards some goal that is not really your ultimate and authentic way of being a leader. So one of the things you were talking about was the importance of helping people recognize inclusively all the different ways that a leader can look, sound, act, et cetera. And I notice, maybe you've noticed the same, that there seems to be a little bit of a backlash going on against some of the DEI focus. I guess backlash is a strong word, but some sort of pulling away from that priority. I'm wondering what thoughts you have about that. And I would love for you to inspire folks in organizations that may be thinking about it again, and maybe thoughts you might have that would help folks recognize the value of that profound, inclusive approach? Yeah, I think a lot comes down to what the goals of your organization are, right? And I've always looked at diversity, equity, and inclusion, these kinds of ideas from the context of how is this going to help us achieve our goals better? And how is it going to ensure that our staff members feel like they can be at their best, that they can contribute in the optimal ways that they can stay with us longer if they're our most skilled talent and that they're inspired to perform at their best. And when it comes down to it, any human being really wants to be seen, they want to be heard, they want to be able to contribute. And especially in a sector like ours, you are not motivated by perks. I can give you all kinds of financial benefits, but that's not why you've come to Room to Read. You've come to Room to Read so that you can be your best self and contribute to issues that you think need to be fixed in this world. This helps everyone, right? And so I think if you start looking at it not from the perspective of if one person is able to express themselves, I'm not, but rather if that person has the permission to express themselves, so do I. And there's only good that could come from open conversation, open communication, because 98% of our challenges can be solved if we actually communicate properly. And so 
with things like diversity, if I understand your perspective or I'm hearing you or giving you space to reflect, we're going to communicate better and you're going to understand why I'm working on this project, why this project is important for the organization. We're all going to be better for it. I find it very inspiring the way you talk about the opportunities that come for all. So I do really appreciate that. Is there anything that surprised you about being CEO? Yeah, I think the level of potential and opportunity that exists as a CEO when you're looking out into the world and thinking about what this organization can be and can do. I knew that I would have more influence and that I'd obviously be able to direct the organization, but the number of choices, right, can be overwhelming in our space because you have a lot of other organizations that want to partner. You have a lot of need, a lot of demand, a lot of places you can be. You have a lot of things that influence education that are perhaps seen like other sectors like health or nutrition, sexual reproductive health, et cetera, things that clearly impact the way education transpires and the types of skills children need, more recently climate, environment-related issues. But thinking about who we should be requires a lot of discipline. And I think that level of discipline was a bit of a surprise. I want to tie that back because what you're describing is the incredible need for clear focus. And earlier, you were speaking about the power of purpose. And I guess I have to kind of tie those together and ask, was it the purpose of the organization that helped you develop the focus or was it something else? The mission of the organization definitely plays a key role in focusing everything that we do. So if it comes down to making a decision on do we go this way or that way, we're always coming back to which one is going to further our mission. And when we talk about furthering our mission, what do we mean by that? Are we talking about breadth? Are we talking about depth? Are we talking about cost? Right? What is driving some of those decisions and how do we think about the role that they play? So I think that's definitely a guiding factor. The other on the personal front is really thinking about the manner in which you prioritize How do I involve my team that is all over the world and represents a lot of needs, you know, in terms of the different government systems we're working with and the paths to scale and bring us all together to prioritize, given all the options we have? What is going to help the largest portion of our portfolio when we think about our resourcing and how can we articulate that? And how do we encourage leaders to come to the table and make their case? for why choosing this path or the other is going to help their portfolio and how does that benefit children ultimately the most effectively. It almost sounds a little bit like the process that I've seen some investment firms use when they're looking at investment opportunities. I imagine there's some similarity there. You're picking up on it exactly. We have an entire process around resource allocation where we look at the number of children benefited, the resources that are needed, the skill sets that are needed, what capacity we have internally and externally. Very similar to many for-profit enterprises as they're thinking about where they're going to invest their resources. And that has allowed us, because again, the choices are many, the need is high. So we have to be able to focus if we are going to get the most benefit out of every investment that we make. That's great. So the title of this podcast, as you know, is To Lead is Human. And I like to give every guest an opportunity to say, what does that mean to you to lead as human? I think it's such a perfect title, given some of the conversation that we had today and this point I was making earlier about how anyone can lead from any seat, right? It's just being human gives us the ability to develop leadership qualities, and we might develop them in different ways based on our own life experiences. But Ultimately, any one of us can be visionary. Any one of us can make good decisions or collaborate effectively or be in a process of continuous learning. It's just looking at how our life experiences and our skills development play a role in doing that. And do we recognize those strengths in us enough to help share our experiences with others, right, and allow them to learn from our example? And so I think it's just a perfect way of describing leadership in the current moment where any of us can be a leader if we truly want to be one. Yeah, I've long held that belief, and I think it's driven a lot of my own work over the years in large-scale change, helping executives lead change, and now primarily coaching executives, that if you want it, it's within reach. It might not look like what you thought it looked like. Right, exactly. It's just being conscious of 
what you can bring to the table, what perspectives and insights you can share, and similarly, what you can learn from others, right, in terms of how they can be examples to you. I know for myself, I'm not 100% of the way there by any means, but I have this aspiration to bring myself to my interactions with others authentically and transparently every time because I want my interactions with people to feel deep, like the best part of their day. I want to enrich their life and I want to be enriched by that interaction because ultimately I've made a choice to spend part of my day with this person or group of people and I've prioritized that conversation. So I should make the most of it and hopefully make it meaningful for them. And I think as a result of that, my decisions, my mindset are just better and healthier because I have more information, I have more meaningful perspective. And hopefully in through those interactions, those individuals I'm interacting with feel that they have the opportunity to lead me and my thinking just as I do theirs, right? So I think it's a very powerful way of thinking if you really give yourself the permission to be a leader. Very much so. So what do you know now that you wish you'd known 10 years ago? Well, one is that leaders come in different forms, and different styles. And my natural tendency to be a very curious person that holds like learning at the foundation of my being is a very natural way to be a leader for the type of organization that I run. And that's okay. And figuring out how that manifests for me and my team is part of the journey. And I am not a static leader. I'm also going to change in the way that I lead and my style is going to continue to evolve as I learn more and I experience more. I think it's important to be really humble. There's way too much information and knowledge out there for you to have a grasp of everything. So I personally spend a lot of time engaging with neuroscientists and economists and others who might help me think about how transforming an education system can be more effective part of Room to Read's portfolio. And how can I become more risk tolerant because I've built up enough resilience in our team and with our skill sets to take on bigger challenges? Right. So I think it's as long as we are open to that notion that we don't stay the same person forever, the same way organizations don't either. And that flexibility and that insightfulness is important. So as we're wrapping up today, what's a piece of advice that you might like to share with our listeners to help them become more successful leaders and build more fully human workplaces? Yeah, it's not revolutionary advice, but I will advocate for it. Being present, listening, coming to every conversation as though you have something to learn is probably the best advice I've ever been given and probably the number one thing that has made me successful in what I wanted to achieve in my life. Well, this has just been such an eye-opening and inspiring conversation, and I so appreciate your joining in. So let me say thank you so much to Dr. Geetha Murali for joining today and sharing her own journey. I'm going to guess some listeners might like to know how to find out more about you or more about Room to Read. What's the best way for folks to stay up to date on you? Well, I invite your listeners to learn more about us at our website, www.roomtree.org. And of course, on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you get your information, please do follow our journey. And we will be releasing our upcoming film on our girls' education program called She Creates Change for International Day of the Girls. So you'll get to learn a lot more about our programs and hear from the girls themselves through that initiative. When is that due to come out? It'll be in October for International Day of the Girl this year. So exciting. I can't wait. Well, again, Geetha, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. It has been my absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for bringing your leadership lessons to all of us as we learn to be better and more inspirational leaders. Please stay with us for a moment and I'll share some takeaways and coaching tips to help you improve your own leadership starting right away. So one of the most powerful things I heard from Geetha today is leaders light a path for others. And several of the key takeaways from our conversation really support that belief of hers. Starting with her statement, 
that she thinks the key to effective leadership is being a clear and effective communicator. Let me unpack it a little more for you. One, leaders as role model. Gita is very clear that she has to act consistently with her espoused values and also described obligations for staying humble as she's learning and growing. At the same time, being bold in setting goals for the organization so that she's increasing its reach even while she is humble about her own leadership. And then lastly, being flexible in how to reach those goals, including the many voices to help find the right approaches for each situation. The second big takeaway, have clear non-negotiables in your organization. Everyone assumes this is important for profits, and I believe she is right in saying it's just as important for any business. So the room to read clear non-negotiables are that education and literacy are human rights, that they must partner broadly in order to be successful, that their success metrics should always reflect the impact they're having rather than revenues or profits, and also respect as a cornerstone of the organization. What Geetha points out, and I think it's true for every organization, inclusion and belonging is necessary if you are to make the most of every employee's skills and every dollar you invest in the people in your organization. The third big lesson that Geetha shared with us is learn from everyone. And she talked about learning first from her mother, describing their family's ability to go from almost a child bride to CEO in one generation. Very, very inspiring. So of course she learned from her mother, but she also identified learning something different from each of the four board chairs she's had. It's especially important, she says, to build credibility when you don't look quite like what's expected, let's say, of a CEO of such a large and impactful organization. And I think this is something very deeply reflective of Geetha's own humility. So these three takeaways really serve her needs as CEO in a couple ways. It helps her make sure that she can have transformational leaders at every level of the organization. And it's very much increased her ability to influence broadly across every stakeholder group that the organization comes into contact with. So, wow, how do we boil this down into one coaching tip? I think regardless of what your role is or where you work, you might take this challenge. Can you redefine your own goals in terms of their ultimate impact in the world? And if you could, how might this change the way you think about your organization's priorities and its focus, what you invest in and why? As a reminder, Room to Read has two main metrics, which Geetha mentioned several times. How many children benefit from their work and how quickly they reach those children. So to use this as an analog for your own impact metrics, challenge yourself and your team to concretely define the following. Who benefits from the work we do? And how do they benefit? Who else benefits and how? And what are those few key impact metrics that you want to use to quantify your organization's success? I'm Sharon Richmond, and this has been To Lead as Human. You can find out more about me at leadinglarge.com. That's L-E-A-D-I-N-G, large.com. To Lead as Human is part of the Mirror CFM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Soul Savvy Business and Making It. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Andrew Chapman assembled the episode, and Marvin Del Rosario was the audio editor. Danny Eaney is our executive producer. So you don't miss upcoming episodes, Please follow us on Mirror CFM's YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast player. If you learned anything useful today, can you take a minute and leave us a starred review and tell your colleagues about what you learned? The more leaders we can reach, the better for everyone. Thank you so much for listening today, and we'll see you next time on To Lead is Human. <music>